Okay, we're going to have a workshop update on truck climbing lanes presented by Brent Green from District 9 Caltrans. Thank you. I don't know if this works or not, but if, if not, I'm sure you can hear me anyway. Is this? All right. All right, here I go. Um, you guys are prompt. Wow, I'm impressed. Um, I saw 605. I thought I'd wander in at 605, but you're right there. So anyway, good evening. Um, I'd like to start by just thanking you for providing us an opportunity this evening to, pro to provide an update on this uh, important project, which you're all very aware of, which is a proposed truck climbing lane project on 58, SR58 eastbound. For those that don't know, I'm Brent Green. I'm the district director for District 9. Um, our district represents Eastern Kern County. So we uh, serve your needs in Kern County on State Routes 178, US 395, State Route 14 and State Route 202, and also on State Route 58, at, starting at post mile 77.252. So what that means to you is our district boundary starts roughly a quarter mile east of what the Caliente exit would be. So if that makes sense to you, that's where the boundary starts between District 6, the Fresno office, and, and District 9. Uh, the purpose of tonight's meeting is to present our findings from the project initiation document. Many of you I know are very um, versed in transportation projects. For those that may, may not be as familiar with how project delivery works, the, uh, the project initiation document is a planning document. It's really the, the document that starts a dialogue. It's very early in the process. Um, it's designed relatively to give guidance to future phases. Given that, I'll, when you see the presentation tonight, there's details on environmental, on design, on right-of-way, on construction. Those are all based on very little information going in. This, again, this is a very rough, kind of a, a, an opening dialogue. So we have wide ranges of information in terms of costs, in terms of a lot of, of features. So when you see this tonight, this, this is a, a, a starting point. It's not cast in stone. It's something that, that we're get using to get a dialogue open. So we, we kind of want your feedback, and we'll continue to get feedback as we go forward. Um, we've done some outreach. Some of you we've met with numerous times on this project. Uh, others we may not have yet. Uh, we've been having dialogues, and we've had actually other presentations, I think, before this board uh, previously. So this is kind of a culmination of some of those those previous discussions. So uh, the format for tonight, we've got a, a brief video we're going to start with, which just kind of gives an outline of the purpose and need of the project. Then Brian Wessling is, who is here at the very end. He's our um, design manager who's actually worked to, to present and prepare the project initiation document. And to my left over here, Christine Nadler. She is our public information officer. And she's done a great job uh, as well promoting this project. So. Um, I know we have only got you know 25 minutes. I'm not sure the extent of the questions. If we start, you know, getting um, too bogged down with questions, then you know we'll stay. We'll stay later. We'll stay afterwards. So we're we're open to do that or or later. Some of these some of this information is very detailed. So you may may want to defer some of the longer things for later. We're happy to stay and provide that information to you. So everybody good? Should we get started? Let's roll. California's economy is growing. On its own, it ranks fifth in the world, ahead of countries like France, India, and the United Kingdom. A vital contributor to our economy is the agricultural output of the fruitful San Joaquin Valley. In 2017, the agricultural sector of the valley was valued at roughly $35 billion, a nearly $10 billion increase from 2010. As its economic output has boomed, several transportation-dependent industries, such as distribution, logistics, and manufacturing, have sprouted up around it. In Kern County, food and beverage manufacturing account for 88% of all manufacturing jobs. More than 250 crops are grown in the region. Moving all that product to the rest of the country requires a lot of trucks, many of which take the same road out of California. State Route 58. Bakersfield is one of the fastest growing cities in California, and driving through the heart of it is State Route 58. It's one of California's main west to east freight routes connecting the San Joaquin Valley to the rest of the nation. With only two lanes in each direction, the road gets crowded as freight trucks compete for space with the thousands of cars, trucks, and other vehicles that use the 58 corridor each day. 
and it's only going to get more congested as freight traffic is expected to increase by up to 40% over the next 20 years. Freight trucks currently make up one third of all traffic through the corridor, and these trucks can slow down to 35 miles per hour below the speed limit when traveling over the steep, sustained grades eastbound traffic faces. The issue is compounded when slightly more capable trucks attempt to pass those slower than them. Having two or more trucks traveling at slow speeds in both lanes creates a ripple effect on the passenger vehicles they share the road with. For commuters and travelers trying to reach their destinations, the experience is frustrating. Keeping traffic moving efficiently and safely through the corridor is one of the main concerns for Caltrans. We recognize that it's a vital throughway for residents, businesses, tourists, and the companies that rely on it to move their products around the country. That's why Caltrans is proposing a project that will improve operations by adding a truck climbing lane at three separate sections of the eastbound direction where grades incline at an average of 3.7 to 5 percent. With trucks contained to their own lane, commuter traffic will be able to ascend the grade more quickly. The truck climbing lane project is still in the planning stages. As Caltrans moves forward with it, we're exploring various funding options from local, state, and federal sources that will make this project a reality. My name is Brian Wessling. I'm the senior design engineer in charge, responsible for developing the planning study for the truck climbing lanes. Um, I, I've been here before about approximately a year ago to present to, to the council. Um, we recently completed the project initiation document, um, I, or nearly completed, I should, I should say. Um, we're still awaiting several signatures, but it's, um, for all intents and purposes, 100% complete. Um, I'm here to present some of the, and to discuss some of the engineering features, some of the impacts, and just the general layout um, and technical aspects of the truck climbing lanes. So I have a 13 slide PowerPoint that everyone should have a copy of in case you can't see the monitor. So we really discussed the status of the project, but basically what I wanted to, to discuss with this slide is that the costs at this point, because it is a planning study, are given as a range of costs. We simply don't have enough information to define with probability a programmable construction cost. So everything's given as a range, the right-of-way capital and the construction capital. Currently, we, have, we don't have any funding source identified, so that's another reason why we're here. What, what our plan with this project initiation document is, is to fund the environmental and preliminary engineering studies for all three truck climbing lanes, all three locations, but construct them with individual construction projects to phase them. So we'll do all the environmental work, um, and then we'll do multiple construction projects. So best case scenario, um, we get funding. We do all three with one construction project, but most likely we would have to do them each one at a time. And they're each approximately $30 million. But we'll get into that. I'll, I'll give you more detail about that here really soon. I think that video really demonstrated and articulated the, the project's purpose and needs. So I'm not gonna discuss that anymore. I think if you've driven up route 58, you know why we're proposing this truck climbing lane. We spent several weeks looking through old highway as-built um, records. Um, we came down here multiple times and drove, spent days driving up and down, getting out, measuring the grade, observing traffic patterns. Uh, we've talked to locals, um, we've talked to city officials, um, we've, we've talked to some of you to get input on where the correct places f for these truck climbing lanes would be. And we've decided on three locations 
Um, we could do more. We could always do more in the future, but for this project and this study, we're really looking at the three steepest locations on Route 58 between basically the bottom of the valley floor at General Bale Road all the way to the top near Tehachapi at Route, um, Route 202 intersection. That's about, yeah. The steepest location and the location with the steepest sustained grade is what we're calling location two. And it's basically from just west of Billville Road um, to just west of Hart Flat Road. That, in, in location two, the roadway ascends at a maximum grade of 8% for almost two miles, 1.86 miles. So that's that has the steepest sustained grade on the whole route. Um, because of that, we would recommend that be the first priority project, the first one to be constructed. The second I'm so, priority I'm sorry, project. Sorry, you said eight percent at six percent, right? Uh, I'm sorry, six percent for 1.86 miles. The second priority that we would recommend in terms of construction staging would be location one, uh, which would which encompasses um, Bina Road. That ascends at a maximum grade of five percent for just about two miles. The third priority that we would recommend in terms of construction staging is what we're calling location three and that's up towards the top of the grade encompassing broom road that ascends briefly at a grade of 5.5 percent for about 0.35 miles but that location number three on average ascends 3.73 percent for about 2.46 miles so really it has the lowest average grade and from what we've witnessed um, th the trucks seem to make it up there fairly well they they can be aided um, they, they tend to have some acceleration come in some speed coming down um, past Hart Flat and Keene Road um, but but that that is a location that that could definitely use a truck climbing lane as well Okay, some of the engineering features and just layout of what we're proposing. We're proposing the truck climbing lane be extended to the top of the hill. So for location one um, at Bina Road, we propose the truck climbing lane extend past the Bina Road and then up that second little hill. And with the intent of accelerating trucks on the downslope, and then ultimately bringing them up to highway speeds and then merging them with the general flow traffic while they're at highway speeds and then dropping the lane. So going back to the previous slide, you can notice that all of the truck climbing lane locations end on the downslope, about a half a mile or a quarter mile on the downslope. And that's to allow for that um, easy merging at, at highway speed. The proposal at this point is to widen asymmetrically on the outside shoulder. There's there's several reasons for this, um, which I can go into, but I, I won't right now. Um, the, the layout that we're proposing would include what we're calling a 14-foot truck climbing lane, but two of those feet would be comprised of barrier striping between the general flow lane and the truck climbing lane. So in, in essence, the truck climbing lane would be 12 feet wide. But right here, I'm showing 14. So I just want, want to make sure everyone understands that. Now about a year ago, when I last presented what, what our concepts were for this project, I presented two alternatives. One, basically more retaining walls, and another alternative, fewer retaining walls. Well, we went back into the office, we did some research, we looked at what the cost of these retaining walls would be, we looked at how they would be constructed, um, the types of traffic control and the delay that they would that would be caused by by building these retaining walls. I'm talking about fill side retaining walls, not cut side retaining walls. Um, and what we found is that in in general, 
um, purchasing new right of way is vastly less expensive than building retaining walls. These retaining walls would require temporary retaining walls in order to construct them um, because they're going to be huge with massive foundations that are going to actually go under the highway. Um, we're going to have a back slope there and we still need to perpetuate traffic. Um, and so uh, this this picture that I've included in, in here up, up on the board in, in, in your handouts is from a, re a project that we recently built in District 9 called the High Point Curve Correction. And you could see how the contractor chose to build a temporary retaining wall to maintain traffic flow above that retaining wall while they built the real retaining wall, the final retaining wall. So there's two costs. Well, there's really three costs if you consider user costs, delay costs. Retaining walls in a constrained location are very expensive and very difficult to build. And that's why this new project initiation document, this new planning document, eliminated almost all of the walls except for where we know that we would be affecting sensitive environmental resources um, or uh, perhaps the railroad where we're getting on location three where we get really close to the railroad right of way. Um, only in locations like that um, where we're the choice to, to send a fill slope down into Tehachapi Creek or build a retaining wall, we're going to build a retaining wall. But in terms of an economic cost benefit analysis, analysis, really buying the new right of way is vastly less expensive. So I just wanted to explain that that's a change since the last time I came here and presented this project. Let's take a look a little bit more in depth at each of the locations and the alternatives. Location one has two alternatives. Alternative one for location one, this is Bina Road, would perpetuate Bina Road. Okay, so it wouldn't alter any of the access or circulation patterns. However, we would have to widen the bridge that goes over Bina Road at a cost between three to four million dollars. Also, as evidenced in this photograph here, um, the truck climbing lane is going to physically, it, it's going to occupy the same space as Bina Road. So we're going to have to offset Bina Road. But at this point, Bina Road is in that massive cut. So there's an additional expense of offsetting Bina Road and the additional earthwork that's going to be needed for the offset. But that's, that's all, it's, we can do it. It's easy to do. Um, there's going to be a decision point. And let me show you what alternative two looks like. Alternative two at location one proposes removing the bridge at Bina Road. Um, we would ensure that no parcels got landlocked. Everyone would still have access to either a county road. They would have ingress and egress access rights. Um, and in all honesty, really, I think there's only, we'll have to, I'll have to confirm this, I believe there's only two landowners out here anyways that would be directly affected by the removal of Bina Road. But we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to do more research in, in, in the next phase of this project and um, get all of that worked out. What this would do, if we remove the bridge at Bina Road, this red up here on the screen, 2.3 miles of Bina Ro Road, we would simply remove or perpetuate as a dirt road in some fashion to some extent for ranch access um, with the gate potentially if they didn't want access people accessing um, the, the ranch uh, those we're going to work we're going to work all that those details out later um, so what this would do is it would change the circulation because if one were to want to drive from bakersfield to the bakersfield national cemetery traditionally currently one would just drive on Bina Road, cross the bridge, come through here, and then turn on, on Route 223 to the cemetery. Well, the circulation pattern would be changed. They would now have to take Caliente Bodfish Road and then Beelville Road, and then go west on Route 58, and then finally turn left on Route 223. So that would increase the, the, the trip for by about six miles. But alternative to removing the bridge 
is about three to four million dollars less expensive than alternative one. In general, both of these alternatives range between 20 and 30 million dollars for the construction and right of way 600 to 600,000 to about a million dollars. I'm, I'm confused. Can you go back? Yes. So when you're going to the National Cemetery, you just go up 58 and you turn right on 223. What, what are you talking about going around? Okay, so if you're coming from, can you see my mouse here? No, we, I don't. Um, so in the upper left-hand corner of that photograph is Bina Road as it comes out of the valley. So if one were driving on that, they would then follow that red path over the bridge, across our, our road. Oh, if you were coming up on Bean Road, not on 58. Right. Okay, right. so you'd, right. you'd have to be accessing it from Bean Road to Correct. begin with. Okay, I'm with you. I'm with that you. would be the change of circulation. Okay. Otherwise, it, it, there, would, there would be minimal difference. I'm with you. Yeah. Okay, location two. Um, this is the highest priority location. The costs range between 23 and $35 million. Um, this location would be really difficult to construct because of the, the just the ranging topography. This is where we have the large stepped cuts. Um, we would need a water diversion at Clear Creek. There's a lot of right of way that we're gonna need. Um, and then we're gonna have to reconfigure the, the Baleville Road um, intersection. There's only one alternative for location two. It's build, no build. Location three has two alternatives. One would be to replace Broom Road Bridge. We're gonna have to lengthen the bridge to go over the truck climbing lane um, at a cost of about $4 million. Alternative two, location three, would pr proposes to remove the, road, the, the bridge at Broom Road. Um, What that does is then create some circulation issues for some of these adjacent parcels that were traditionally used Broom Road to access either westbound or eastbound Route 58. So a, a circulation study is gonna be needed to determine how viable this is, what the access rights, um, what access rights uh, these belong to these, these parcels currently, and what it would take to establish or reestablish or even purchase access rights to make this a viable alternative but by removing the road the bridge at broom road um there would be about a six million dollar savings for for altern for location three okay let's talk about costs this is the last slide the range of capital costs, so this is this this would be the construction contract and the purchase of the right of way, the environmental mitigation and the easements and 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 the relocation of the utilities. Okay, so this the 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 engineering and the environmental study costs are not included in this. This is just the construction contract. Um, for location one, alternative one, we're looking at a range between twenty three and thirty four million dollars. Um, alternative two is a little bit less expensive, but with similar right-of-way costs. Now, location three is what I have highlighted here in green. Um, that is our number one priority. It has the highest and s sustained grades. That would cost between 23 and $35 million for the construction contract. Now, if funding were available, we could do all three at the same time with and that would cost between 86 and 128 million dollars with 3.7 to 6.1 million in, in right-of-way costs that's that's all I have thank you um, does anyone have any questions or comments I, I have a comment thank you Brian um, you mentioned that uh, uh, the truck lanes would be built on the up slope and then uh, you would use a down slope to accelerate the, the trucks to the uh, speed of the traffic, but aren't trucks um, uh, restricted uh, on their speed by their weight? In other words, when they're going down slope, they're also going slow. So I'm, I'm wondering whether that's a good assumption that this, the trucks would be 
at the rate of uh, the rest of the traffic, which I believe they would not. The, the trucks are definitely limited on the downhill grades, especially on sustained grades. Like if, if they were coming westbound, they would, they would be limited on that. Um, I believe, and people who have driven this more and observed more could, could please correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I've observed is the majority of the trucks going eastbound, when they do, most of them are familiar, they seem to be familiar with this route. When they do, when they are going eastbound and they start descending these smaller hills, they're not, they're not very long, they let it rip. They, they accelerate to highway speed. That's what I've seen. Um, perhaps they see the bottom of the hill and that's a visual cue to them to, you know, this would be a good time to pick up speed for the next grade. That's that's what I've observed. Jay, have you, do you, what do you think? So I, I think with that, with that distance, cre those trucks cresting that vertical curve and then looking pretty much straight down on the, the, the next sag where they have to come up, I, I think that's a visual cue for them to, to really pick up some speed. Thank you. You're welcome. At the intersection of 58 and 223, uh, I know I've been at some workshops and some studies and feasibility studies of separation of grade. There is there's that's not included in these in these tr truck climbing lane scenarios, correct? It, it, no, it's not. Uh, if we're going to do it right, at some point, you need to have that grade separation at uh, Caliani Road and. Uh, at 223 at the National Cemetery with the number of of uh, of events occurring at the at the cemetery increasing daily uh, and then the line of sight on that particular downgrade that you say where they are accelerating to pick up speed now you're approaching the intersection there which has a line of sight issue and then you add some fog in the in the mix it, it's it's gonna be uh, continue to be an issue and I'd like to see that somewhere uh, not necessarily addressed here but at one point we had uh, even talked to Veterans Administration to see if there was any kind of funding for separation of grade where you could eliminate two separations Caliente Road not being at grade but have a frontage road come down to 223 on the north side of 58 and then have your grade separation there and folks that need to go back up to Caliente from from eastbound would come up a frontage road which already exists on the south side and then they could uh, they could make it over to Caliente uh, one note uh, kind of is befuddling is the uh, is that being a road that comes back around through Bealeville I'm not sure anybody would ever use that to attend a service at the at the cemetery it would most I would say 99.9% .9 of people would come up 58 and take a right turn. I'm not sure why that scenario, all that does is, is uh, you're, I see where you're eliminating the overcrossing or of, of being a road uh, and then the elimination of, because it, it's going to be terminated. So you're talking about just a couple of landowners affected by that, it sounds like. So yes, like this that. overall scenario of that big green uh, path to come back through. I'm not sure if it makes a lot of sense even for the study, but just just throwing that out. But the separation of grade, I think, really should continue to be in the mix. Um, my other comments were, you were saying that some of these could be done in phases. The worst part of the grade, the uh, number two could be done first, let's say, if we could get the funding for it, correct? Correct. You're going to do all the preliminary uh, engineering and everything for all three, but you could actually that's construct possibly earlier on the, one of them. That's that's the proposal right now. We haven't found funding yet for all of the pre preliminary engineering, but that's that's our hope right now. That's that's how we're positioning ourselves with yeah. this 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 planning study. Have we considered going to the private sector to get a little bit of help with funding? to seed the pot for matching of grants or whatever. We have, has Amazon come online yet or it's about to? It's near. I don't know, have your studies 
included the the Amazon Center, what it's going to add to the count. Not not in terms of like developer impacts. No, not in that term, but in terms of what's the additional traffic truck count on 58 going to be once it opens. We 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 don't have the exact numbers, but generally we're we're anticipating large increases a in significant traffic. number yes. that adds yeah, to the mix so like, i think the freight study that we recently completed takes those distribution centers into account so yes we don't do it incrementally by you know uh, manufacturer but yes the freight study that we had that was the same consultant that actually did in nevada right did take those distribution centers in, into account yes would those distribution centers have any inkling or reason to want to contribute to the to the cause being that they're they're being impacted by by the the uh, traffic being, uh, you know, the snarls on 58, because we've got m even more in the, in the pipeline w with the uh, with Shafter and those areas becoming uh, you're going to have more distribution centers uh, from the freight study. Uh, I'm just throwing a thought out there. Is there any way that those people would? Uh, ante up and contribute to the cause that would allow us any leverage for federal funding, or does it just I, not work that I, way? <laughs> that's that's is that a dream? To, it, it it might be. It's something to explore. I I know we have the developer impact fees that we impose on on landowners. I don't know how if they extend regionally. Yeah, I, I think they're more locally about how they're affecting a certain interchange that they're the one interchange where they're accessing the, the state route. Um, I'll, I'll I'll bring that back to our planning uh, deputy and and propose and and see what he says. And, and, uh, and, get and back I, I think there is. I was just talking to Jay, you know, uh, briefly here. I think Kern Cog um, has some precedents for that. Some examples of where that's happened. That that wasn't something we've even explored yet in our study. But that I'm glad yeah. you brought that up. I'm just yeah. That's a good idea. That's something we can talk yeah. about. But yeah, that's not something we reviewed. In your uh, in your study that uh, the. Uh, the report from December 10th that you distributed, yes. uh, it shows a timeline from what we're discussing this evening of about six years out, correct? Yes. It seems like an eternity because I've been asking it, for this since I've been on the board here. <laughs> you know, I forget how long I've been here, right. but it's been a long time. It, uh, it, coming up on 20 years, and now we're we're talking 26, 27. Right, and that's that that would be assuming we would start the the environmental studies in 21. And so that that whole schedule is based upon that 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 assumption. What accelerates this besides money? I I honestly I, that's probably about it. Brent, what what would you say? Yeah, I, I would agree. I think the the funding is the is the first step. But I think you know we know from experience, and I, th I think you know this as well. Once we've got that study done, then that really accelerates our opportunity, especially if we go in together on grant funding and things like that. So I, I think that incrementally that'll help in terms of the project schedule. I think Brian's right. I mean, I, I don't know that there's any you know big chunks of things we we can we can chunk chunk out unless we you know simply downscope the project. But yeah, I don't I don't really see any big you know. Um, contributor to, to reducing that that time uh, okay. at least not not at this point yeah. okay with that on the table or not for discussion anyway the 26 27 outlook for a construction project is there other items that would bump it even further out what are we competing against for funding yeah that's that's another good question i think that um you know, we could get into like an hour discussion of just funding. I mean, there's a, okay. lot of, a lot of different things. I think one, <laughs> one thing we haven't talked about, and I think it's beyond probably the scope of tonight, but, you know, we're talking about funding and funding sources. And uh, we've all kind of been working in the last year to try to figure out how to keep get this thing moving yeah. and looking at different fund sources. I think we've kind of come to a consensus that the Trade Corridor Enhancement Program, which is an SB1 funded program administered by the California Transportation Commission, this project meets the, the criteria for that. And there's a call for projects coming up, I think in March 25th range, where the, the applications are due, I think it's June, somewhere in mid-June. I think that's our, our earliest best shot at trying to get uh, funding for this project. And, and I know that there's guidelines for that, and I think there's been workshops. I think probably the, the COG has some of that information already. Certainly if we go in together and, and apply together, Certainly, if there's a matching funds, I mean, there's a lot of things we can do to um, 
you know, to pursue that. And I think KernCog actually got a TCEP project last uh, cycle. So I think you've got some precedent in, in how to do that. But okay. that's that that's our, our aim right now. And I think you've been at meetings as well where we're, yeah. we're nothing's off the table. But um, okay. that's kind of the strategy that we're proposing at this point for funding. Thank you. If I might add, I'm Jay Schlosser. I'm the development director and city engineer for Tatchby. And, and it was about a year and a half ago that uh, – that we started engaging with you guys, and you guys started engaging District 9. I wanted to thank you guys for the report, first of all, but um, did just want to say a couple of things. Um, the, the first is big picture stuff. Um, I think that the 40% that you quoted in your um, video about the potential growth for trucks is probably conservative number. I think with the Centennial Corridor and the recent Kramer Junction bypass, um, this trade, east-west trade corridor route is, is going to be a significant artery to the economy of of you know the whole Central Valley extending probably up into the Bay Area and so it's a really meaningful route and it not only benefits those of us in East Kern who actually drive it on a regular basis but those of you guys in West Kern who you know you've got jobs and you're producing goods this has a this has a lot to do with it and so to the point about uh, development fees there are precedents out there but that kind of looks to the local agencies who are you know who are approving projects uh, you know, big project county and city of Bakersfield to, to be looking at those in your environmental studies and figuring out ways to, to help contribute to some effort like this. But I also uh, wanted to just invite the other agencies. Tatchby sort of just jumped in and, and District 9 has wholeheartedly embraced uh, talking to us about it. And I just wanted to thank you guys again. But the rest of you guys, especially in East Kern, please uh, talk to your staffs about uh, being engaged in this process uh, with us as we try to hunt down funding. I think a unified front to what you said is going to be our best option for trying to make, uh, make the money appear. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say is on 223, uh, the uh, interchange there, that's in District 6, correct? Okay, so, uh, and the COG did a study on that interchange at the 223 for safety reasons a number of years ago, and, and that may be a suggestion, uh, but that will kind of take some engagement that I think is beyond these guys with District 6, um, you know, uh, to, to talk to them about whether there might be shop money or something for that component. Uh, which I think would be a, if you took out the Caliani at grade crossing and the 223 at grade intersection with 58, that's a one mile stretch of freeway in the middle of the otherwise highway. And so for us engineers, that's a really big deal to be able to remove that. And that requires that interchange and some realigning of the roads in the area. So big picture planning. I think this is really great. Thank you guys again for the study and for letting me throw in my two cents. So thanks. Thank you. What kind of dollars, just to keep yeah. your six-year time frame for, mm -hmm. for engineering and environmental is required? I think the next phase, which is project approval and environmental document, we have an estimate of about $5.7 million. Correct. Yeah. And you need that would take a couple of years. That, that's the first work. step. That's what right. we're looking so, Mr. Chairman, can I add? Uh, we were we were heading down the path of using CMAC funds to fund the next phase, but uh, we were shot down at uh, headquarters Caltrans level. So uh, our plan up to about a month ago was to contribute our own CMAC funds to to fund the next phase of the project. Um, that's not no longer a viable option. So uh, we are we will work together with. Caltrans and all of you to see if we can figure out a way to come up with uh, the funds to fund the next phase. But without the next phase, then it's a moot point to talk about the construction phase. Right. So it's not an air quality improvement? It, it, it absolutely is an air quality improvement, and uh, we jointly demonstrated that in our application. The issue was... Um, funding the environmental and uh, preliminary engineering work would not guarantee that those um, air quality uh, improvements be, be realized. So, so that they, the feds want assurances that if, we, if you spend our funds for improving air quality that the air quality actually be improved. Okay, thank you. I have one question. <coughs> the amount here you said on construction and stuff, is that in today's dollars, or that's projected an inflationary and, and, and all that into that uh, budget? Is that today's dollars or that inflation? Today's dollars, yeah. Yeah, it does not include inflation. Okay. Just today's dollars. 
<laughs> yes, thank you. Um, I'd, I'd like to echo uh, <laughs> Councilmember Smith's yeah. comments on the 223 and Highway 58 intersection. My constituents on Arvin, anybody dr driving from 223 does use that. It is very unsafe, and whatever we can do to, uh, you know, you mentioned the study between, you know, with uh, the COG uh, looking into that. You know, I, I support those efforts. Um, and uh, my question is regarding the proposal in the mid-2000s for uh, a transportation measure, how much funding would well, would that have yielded uh, annually? I was not paying attention or I was still in middle school during that time, so. Huh? <laughs> Mayor Girola, that, that would have, have generated in the neighborhood of uh, and it would vary based on the economy. It's it's based on sales tax, it, well in excess of fifty million dollars a year. So this this is an example of a project that we could very easily afford if if we had a um, reli reliable funding source like that. A as an example, the you, you all received TDA funding through the COG, which is one quarter of one percent. Of, of the sales tax collected in the county. For the last year, um, one quarter of 1% was $40 million. So the sales tax measure that, that you're talking about was a half cent. So for, for that particular year, it would have co collected about $80 million. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, the reason I asked that is because I highlight we all have needs in our communities, and yes, this is a certainly a, a, a important need given the goods movement uh, issue and the corridor going from east to west but we can help improve this uh, effort or funding these projects if we have sustainable funding stream not only will we get the 80 million dollars annually but there's statewide funds we can tap into as a self-help county to mm -hmm. be able to do so i know this board um uh most of most of the individuals on this board were opposed to sb1 um but the funding that would fund this project would be coming out of SB1 money. And so I do think we have to have an honest conversation about how we want to provide the services that our communities deserve when we don't have the funds. And so this is another opportunity for us to, or not opportunity, but just to highlight the fact that we need to have that discussion again, at least in my opinion. And I do agree we, we have these multinational corporations uh, within our county uh, and it would be helpful if you know Amazon would pay more than zero dollars in federal taxes every year um, you know to help fund communities and uh, and, and improve them but uh, I, s I support this you know this is close to the community of Arvin but again it's a funding issue and the sport has to have honest conversation on how we want to address the shortfall that we have between services and what we can offer thank you anybody else Yes. Come to the microphone, please, John. Okay. I, I have a question and then I have an observation. The question is, can you separate these three projects, these three sites, and go for funding for just one site? Since you have a priority status, can you do that? And if you can, SB1 funds could come into play hopefully a little quicker and your engineering and, and et cetera could come into play a little quicker? The, the answer is absolutely yes, John. That's the way I think priority one establishes itself. The second thing I have is having driven, driven on that highway with a lot of truck traffic, the minute you create the distance between priority one and priority two, it's gonna be a race to the bottom on a two lane. And let me tell you, that's going to be hell trying to drive a car in that area when trucks try and gain priority to number two. So I don't know how much, it looks to me like it's only about a mile of transition. I don't know that that transition needs to be there. Just an observation. Are, are, are you talking Extending the three lane, the third lane all the way between one and two because it's going to be a race to the bottom to make that priority one. Okay. Okay. I, they I, some I can really run and some can't, and they're going to come all the way over to the to the uh, to the median. Okay. Just thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. I think we're done with that. And we're running late, so we will start our regular meeting. Roll call, please. Alvarado? Here. Corolla? Present. Crump? Here. Cantu? <coughs> Vallejo? Mauer? Here. Scrivener? Cryer? Here. P. Smith? Here. Reyna? Here. Lucinovich? B. Smith? I'm here. Couch? Here. Green? Here. Para? Here. Kiernan? Here. And Gordon? <laughs> Gordon? Thank you. Thank you. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the committee on any matter not on this agenda but under the jurisdiction of the committee. Committee members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. They may ask a question for clarification, make a referral to staff for factual information, or request staff to report back to the committee at a later meeting. Speakers are limited to two minutes with the authority of the chair to extend the time limit as deemed appropriate for conducting the meeting. Please state your name and address for the record prior to making a presentation. Do we have any public comments? Seeing none, I will move on to the consent agenda. Any public comments on the consent agenda? Seeing none, have motion a motion. On, motion on consent. Second. So roll call vote. Corolla? Yes. Crump? Yes. Alvarado? Yes. Mauer? Yes. Breyer? Yes. P. Smith? Yes. Reyna? Yes. B. Smith? Yes. Couch? Yes. Para? Yes. Green? Abstain. And Kiernan? Yes. Mr. Mr. Chairman, can we go back to um, the audit? Mr. Nielsen is here to present that. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so we, we finished with the roll call? Yes. Great. So I want to go back to presentation from Mr. Nielsen, partner with Brown Armstrong, on the financial and compliance audit report. Good evening. Again, my name is Ryan Nielsen. I'm a partner with Brown Armstrong Accountancy Corporation. And it's uh, my pleasure to present to you the results of our audits of your financial statements for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2019. Um, <clears throat> I think you're all aware that the uh, council prepares a set of financial statements each year to comply with uh, laws, rules, and regulations, but also to disclose to the public the activities and uh, financial condition of the council as of the end of the fiscal year. Our responsibility as independent auditors is to perform uh, our audits in accordance with um, our professional standards and to render an opinion as to whether or not your financial statements are uh, fairly presented, accurate, and contain uh, the appropriate disclosures in accordance with accounting principles generally accepted in the United States of America. Um, <clears throat> give you a brief overview of the process, um, hopefully move quickly. I know you've been in here for a while, but uh, uh, generally we start early in the year with uh, correspondence with uh, council's management and ensure that uh, we have updates on significant changes that have occurred 
uh, during the prior period. Um, we conduct what's known as our interim field work where we gather information and assess uh, your uh, changes in internal controls, your checks and balances, if you will, to ensure that you have uh, an effective process for verifying uh, the, uh, the council's transactions. And then any new legal documentation, contracts that are entered into, uh, capital purchases, that sort of thing. And then after the close of the fiscal year, we conduct what's uh, known as our, our final field work for the year end, and that's dedicated to substantiating the account balances and line items that are presented in your, in your financial statements. I think you're aware an audit doesn't include testing every single transaction that runs through the council, but uh, we take what's known as a risk-based approach. We look at areas that uh, either have higher complex accounting uh, procedures involved, um, significant estimates, or a significant amount of transactions. So we focus on grant compliance, grants that are received, the expenditures of those grants, uh, payroll and related um, pension and other post-employment benefit liabilities, if any, and uh, capital asset purchases. Those are um, really the primary focuses of the audit. <clears throat> and at the conclusion of that, wrap it all up in a, in a uh, somewhat tidy report, I guess. They seem to be getting longer every year. But uh, that brings us where we are here today, and that's the presentation of, of the results of our audit. So happy to report the council again received a, a clean audit opinion. It's known as an unmodified audit opinion in, um, in accordance with our professional standards. That's the highest level of opinion that an independent auditor can provide on a set of financial statements. Um, there were no uh, material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in internal controls that were identified and no uh, weaknesses or significant deficiencies in uh, grant compliance. So you're to be commended uh, for that. Um, <clears throat> we also issue reports on, uh, on internal controls that we uh, evaluate in accordance with governmental audit standards, as well as a report on compliance on all major programs um, in accordance with the uniform guidance that's related to your federal grants that are, that are received and expended. And those uh, reports are also unmodified. Um, in addition, we issue a report on compliance with Transportation Development Act and other state compliance, state grant compliance issues, and, and uh, again, no findings or recommendations with regard to uh, the council's uh, expenditure of those funds. So that concludes my presentation. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, congratulations, staff, and thank you for your time. And the, the actual vote comes further on the meeting. We just wanted to... Let him get out a little early. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, item five, uh, Federal Transportation Improvement Program, draft amendment number eight, Ms. Pacheco. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Amendment number eight includes revisions to the transit program that include new projects for the city of Arvin, the city of Delano, and Golden Empire Transit District. The public review period ends January, January 17th, the Kern Cog Executive Director will consider approval of the amendment on January 21st. State and federal approval is required, and at this time, I ask the Chair to please open the public hearing, allow for public comment, and then close the public hearing. Thank you. I will open the public hearing. Do we have any comments? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Caltrans report. Thank you. Just a few uh, announcements I have here. Um, upcoming work, Route 46 at the Y Antelope gr grade. The project is funded in ITIP for PSE. Um, Route 46, segment 4, 4C, we have devel we're developing a strategy and are submitting for uh, the trade corridor enhancement funds this March. <coughs> Upcoming in Kern, we have 10 projects coming in this construction season. The notable ones, uh, 060Q920 to lower the profile at 99 and Panama and White. 
as well as a pavement uh, rehabilitation will be coming out in September because you didn't have enough work there already, <laughs> right? Um, we have uh, 0V280 and Kern 184 and Sunset, a roundabout, coming out in October. Uh, we have a 0S510 Derby Street si signalization in Arvin on 223 and has an extension to advertise, looking to advertise that in June. And uh, the Lost Hill, there will be a Lost Hills rehab in August, uh, 0U470. Ongoing project, uh, 46 conventional highway uh, segment 4A at I-5. Um, we're continuing constructing the ramps at northbound on and off at five, and we still anticipate completion June of 2020 on that one. The project manager, Neil Bretz, has retired. For those of you who knew him, it's now Garth Fernandez. And in the minutes, I'll have the contact, updated contact information for you for the new project managers. Uh, zero Q280, that's uh, State Route 99 uh, rehabilitation. Uh, the work is mainly on northbound side of State Route 99. If you see, we're taking out some concrete along that we've placed. We had some failing test results, if anybody asks. Uh, it's 40-year pavement. When it doesn't pass, we need to remove it and get it right. Um, and there will be extended closures on State Route 204, closed at airport, I think most of you have seen. And we anticipate opening that in early April. Uh, and the northbound on-ramps at Air or airport driver also cl uh, closed. We are on schedule to complete summer of 2012. Uh, summer, 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 summer of 2000. Uh, tw 12th, yeah. Okay, I went back <laughs> to the future, right? 2000, uh, uh, that must be a two. 2022? Yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that, thank you. <laughs> uh, zero Q 180, Summit Hid uh, overhead bridge rails replace uh, bridge rails and State Route 58 into Hatchpee. Uh, still anticipated CCA July 2020. Got that one right. Uh, Liedro uh, uh, Canal median gap closure. Uh, we're continuing work on the widening and replacing shoulders. There will be extended shoulder closure, which will begin, will begin, we will be begin picking up the extended closure shoulder in the next month. Uh, CCA is March 2020, so some of these jobs are finally coming to completion. Uh, 48464 Bell Terrace, uh, Bell Terrace Overcrossing. Uh, we're continuing to construct the retaining wall on 99. Uh, we have no scheduled closures for that project still on schedule to uh, to complete uh, November of this year. I-599 bridge separation and pavement re rehabilitation. Uh, we're lowering the lanes and continuing at Herring Road. Current CCA is November of this year. Stockdale Enos Roundabout. Um, I know they were out there today looking at the traffic flow because there was uh, we've got all four legs online and there's been a little confusion so we're adding some temporary uh, arrows and signs to hopefully help uh, help with that uh, that's two months ahead of schedule we hope to have that done by march so that's some good news um, the 119.43 intersection improvements construct construct a roundabout that's been in open to traffic since november 23rd it was a birthday present to me uh, gap closure rehab. Um, we're continuing work on reinforced concrete pavement uh, and excavating. There will be closures for excavations 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. Uh, to we've got to excavate and replace in the same shift. Uh, es estimated completion is December 2020. Uh, 0E 3204 State Route 178 construct rock blanket gore areas. Uh, we have a two-week closure scheduled at 178 westbound on-ramp from Union starting next week. Uh, CCA will be in March. Cottonwood Rehab, um, the contractors behind schedule and in currently in liquidated damages. 
all striping's done and all lanes should be open by the end of next week and we anticipate accepting the contract in late january also on that project a minerva rodriguez from our group of project manager has retired and paul pineda has taken over her projects and her contact information will be in the in minutes uh, bakersfield freeway connector uh, kern 58 um, a very exciting project, multiple stru uh, structures are under construction. We will have some full closures of 99 over the next two weeks, one each direction for uh, placing the false work for the bridge widening for the westbound 58 to the southbound 99 uh, connector. Uh, it's been an ongoing effort coordinating all these uh, projects and we've been working with the COG and the city and the county, Janet Wheeler, to get this information out to the public as best we can. We're trying, we will keep keep up that partnership. Um, just a couple of other things coming up. Uh, Caltrans exec Executive Order N2320, Homeless Crisis and Sheltered Individuals. Uh, we're currently working on an implementation plan for possible lease of state-owned land for public use. Of, of the 200 cities declared crisis cities, none are in Kern. However, a letter will be going out to all cities soon. Uh, trash pickup par partnerships. Uh, the Bakersfield, Kern, Cogs, uh, Caltrans partnership collaboration since 2013, working with the homeless shelter to pick up trash is, is uh, being used as a role model to the other Cogs. And we want to say thank you to the County of Kern for picking up the sheriff's portion. Uh, Jason Mao is working on agreement and hopes to have it uh, out by February to avoid any interruption. Um, and I just really want to say thank you. It's allowed us to cover a much bigger territory and stretch our dollars much farther. And we appreciate it. And then also in the future, I'd like to add, um, if you have anything you would like me to bring back, you know, I am new, uh, it's my first first one, but don't hesitate to contact me or through Aaron. If you have something you would like me to bring or present to these meetings, I'm more than happy because I wanna be giving you the information you want, so. And that's all I have, if anybody has any questions. Thank you, I just would back up to the Homeless crises, I know the city of Bakersfield declared a crisis. Did they? Okay, I was told there weren't any, but the letter will be going out to everyone. Okay, thank I you. I will add that. Any other questions for Caltrans? Uh, District 9? Yeah, I, <laughs> <laughs> I think you can hear me well enough. Um, each month we, we prepare a status of projects to provide for the board. There's about 24 projects in here that you're welcome to look at. I think that um, probably the project that's uh, most relevant to all of you is the Cash Creek Bridge Replacement. Um, that's where it bottlenecks down just um, east of Tehachapi. That particular project um, is reported to be somewhere just past half complete. We anticipate shifting traffic to the opposite side sometime in uh, late February. Um, our optimistic completion date is mid-summer. We're still holding to a target completion date of, of November 1st. Um, I don't have any other comments on projects unless you have some for me. I will provide you a handout later on. We just recently completed a uh, report on additional uh, closer ca camera locations on State Route um, 58. Uh, some of those are going into construction um, this summer, so you have better travel information once those are prepared. So I'll, I'll, I'll provide this handout to you later. So I think an interesting time. Um, I think I've taken enough time tonight. So unless you have any questions for me, I'm gonna forgo any other comments. Thank you, any questions for District 9? Seeing none, yeah. Executive Director's Report. Uh, good, good evening, Mr. Chairman and board members. I, I will comment, Brent, um, about the long-term permanent um, closures when we replace bridges on 58 work well 98% of the time. But when I-5 closes, um, like it did over Thanksgiving, and 58 is still open, like like what happened over Thanksgiving, it, it does not work well. The, the traffic queued for literally miles a, a, at that location. So in, in the future, um, 
I, w I would like to see District 9 do what, what District 6 does w when they work on I-5 I where it's only two lanes is con construct a, a more permanent detour um, that will not uh, queue traffic uh, as much. A and I, I understand it, it, it uh, costs more and it, in some cases it takes longer, but the, uh, the levels of queuing w were unacceptable. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a few, a few items, Mr. Chairman. CTC meeting in Riverside was December 4th and 5th. I attended. Um, there was discussion about Route 46 in San Luis Obispo County and Highway 99 in Tulare and Madera that many of you engaged in conversations with me and uh, Supervisor Couch also helped, um, Mayor Cantu and uh, uh, council members uh, from Arvin also attended. Um, Bottom line is w without the Valley coming together and speaking up on those those issues, the governor's office would not have restored funding to, to those projects. So um, we, we were heard. Um, I will attend the next CTC meeting where, where that topic will come up again. That's January 29th and 30th in Sacramento. Uh, so the message is uh, good, good work. Thank you all who, who wrote letters and supported me and the other cobs up up and down the valley it, it has worked the san joaquin valley regional policy council and the new multi-agency working group are meeting tomorrow in fresno i will be attending along with uh, council member smith and council member prout from shafter the 2022 regional transportation plan stakeholder meeting which is essentially the kickoff for our 20 22 um, regional transportation plan and SES is January 22nd from 1 to 3 p.m. here at Kerncog. If um, you are interested or know any groups, companies, or organizations that are interested, uh, please extend that invitation to them. Uh, I want to, even though he was already recognized, I'm not sure, is Jay still here? Jay left. Oh, well. <laughs> Jay Slosher, a, um, a chairman of our uh, technical advisory committee and uh, city uh, development and head of development for the city of Tehachapi was very recently named civil engineer of the year for all of California and he will move on to compete at the national level. Congratulations to Jay. Uh, that concludes my report on this agenda, Mr. Chairman, subject to any questions you or the council have. Thank you. Any questions? I had one question. Caltrans mentioned the uh, Enos Lane 119 roundabout, and I was wondering if we had an update on the bike path connection there along that route. Uh, yes, uh, the the county is, as as you know, is preparing plans with a um, ATP grant. They received a one-year extension about nine months ago. They are on schedule to. Um, put that project out for construction within the next month or two, and they will be underway uh, with construction, I've been assured, this summer, which will uh, meet, meet the uh, CTC's deadline, and it will go through the, uh, through the roundabout. So yeah, what brought it to mind was the, the ad about that lightning in a bottle in Memorial Day, so I I'm think I'm hearing it won't be completed by then. It, it will will not even, the construction will not be started, be started okay. uh, w when lightning in a bottle. That was a, a goal that I had pushed the county to at least get it under construction, hopefully done. Literally, the construction will only take 30 to 40 days, uh, actual work, uh, days of work. Uh, but no, it's on, it will not, 100% will not be done before lightning in a bottle. So construction may start June, July is the current estimate? I was assured it would start this summer, and I, would <laughs> I, remi I reminded I reminded county staff that summer goes all the way till September. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any I other comments? Have a question. Um, I so there isn't going to be a call for any TDA Article Three this year because there's a backlog of of past projects that haven't been um, completed. Is there a list of of those past projects so that we can kind of see where those where those projects are 
so, so uh, at the uh, all of you know um, Pete Smith, uh, the gentleman on our staff who handled uh, TDA Article Three, retired. Um, we have a, a new person in charge, and I've charged him with uh, reconciling um, all the TDA projects. And he's he's already brought to my attention that there is there are some projects that go back as far as 2011 that have either not been built or not been billed. So uh, the first order of business is to reconcile all, all the cities and the counties TDA3 projects. Um, there are already some cities that have said the projects that they received several years ago will, um, will not be built. Um, the money will go back into the pool. Uh, as as you know, w we we were planning on not having a call for projects in the fiscal year that that we're moving into. This is this um, this process that we're taking underway will likely free up um, a significant amount of money. It could be as much as half a million to a million dollars. Um, and I've I've talked to several agencies. We will take this to the TTAC and the full board ultimately, but some of the things I'm thinking about are fun funding projects that are potentially underfunded, because um, as, as you know, and many of you know, many of the projects that are on track are coming in much uh, the bids are coming in much higher than expected. That's one option to fund projects that come in over. Another pro uh, option is to have a new call for projects. And uh, even another option is is to put the money into maintenance of existing bike and ped facilities. Uh, and I know building new facilities is sometimes more uh, attractive or sexy than maintaining them. But we we have in general not put enough money into maintaining those facilities. So all all those are on the table. Uh, stay tuned. In the next uh, couple of months, it will play out, and it will ultimately come back to you on uh, what my recommendation and what the T-Tax recommendation will be. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, that meeting's adjourned. And we start the next one. Uh, roll call, it's the same. Public comments, yes. Supervisor Couch did leave. Oh, public comment. State your name. Please. Good evening, good evening, Chair and Board Members. My name is Troy Hightower, and I'm here uh, today representing the Kern Transportation Foundation (KTF). They're hosting a guided tour of the Port of Long Beach on February 5th, and um, it includes a bus transportation from Bakersfield to the port. The port itself will be providing a tour of the port and then the transportation back to Bakersfield. So it's an all in one day event. Um, I don't, I only have one flyer for the announcement. Um, you can go to Eventbrite. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, Eventbrite, B-R-I-T-E. You can get information there about the event as well as buying tickets, they're uh, $60 a person. Um, breakfast <coughs> and snacks will be provided at the beginning. And I don't know if any of you have been to the port, it's an amazing place and I strongly suggest that you, you um, take this tour. I'm, I'm sure you'll be amazed about what goes on in, in the port. Um, I believe we've, Rob, did we have an uh, email message to you on the flyer? The flyer's all electronic now. Uh, we, we send it out to our three interest groups, yeah. Like we, okay. Uh, so, so we, if there's any board members, could you maybe email it to them? Yeah. On the flyer, you can actually click on the link, and it'll take you to Eventbrite to purchase tickets. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that'd be great if you can email that out, Rob Dolls. Appreciate it. Any other public comments? Seeing none, I will move to the consent agenda. Any Public comments on the consent agenda? Seeing none, can I have a motion? So move. Second. Roll call vote. Garola? Yes. Crum? Aye. Alvarado? 
Yes. Mauer? Yes. Breyer? Yes. B. Smith? Yes. Reyna? Yes. B. Smith? Yes. Thank you. Executive Director's Report. G good evening again, uh, Mr. Chairman and Board Members. The uh, Regional Awards Ceremony that we hold uh, each March is scheduled for March 5th at the Seven Oaks Country Club. Please reserve your uh, seats or tables early. We have over 110 RSVPs and we could only hold around 180. It's filling up much, much faster than usual this year. March 10th and 11th, 2020 is our Valley Voice trip to Sacramento. Please uh, let me know if you're interested in going. The, the primary representatives to that trip would be Supervisor Scribner, Councilman Smith, or Councilman Prout. If, um, if those members of that group cannot go, we will extend the uh, invitation to, to all the others. Again, 10th and 11th in Sacramento. March 25th and 26th will be a California Transportation Committee meeting in Santa Barbara. Uh, COG staff will be there. That will be when the 2020 STIP will be adopted by the CTC and we anticipate that the projects that I've talked about repeatedly on 99 and 46 will be restored thanks to all of our efforts. As a reminder, it's a new year. Our Form 700s are due. Uh, I filled mine out today, and I did notice on the first page that um, there is an option if you serve in multiple positions, with which all of you do, that you can just add that one line uh, to your Form 700 that you already have to fill out uh, for your city position to say this is an, an additional position I hold at Kern Cog, and please hand those in to us um, over the next couple of months. Uh, KCAC, Kern, Kern County Association of Cities, will be meeting on the 27th in Maricopa. You and your staff should have received uh, emails in the last couple of days. In your folder this evening is a copy of the presentation made by Caltrans District 9. Um, the final version of the contract between UC Davis and KernCog studying trucks on I-5. KernCog uh, Kern news and events for December and January. Timeline covering the next four months. Uh, information on uh, from California Air Resources Board from November 2019 to so the AB 617 staff report, uh, which which reminds me, the last time we met in November, we talked about uh, the possibility of Arvin and Lamont area being um, selected as the next uh, test area or, or chosen city. Um, we, tr we transmitted our desire for Ar Arvin and Lamont to be um, submitted to th to the San Joaquin Valley Air District that uh, Supervisor Couch serves on. They submitted that and um, and a portion of Stockton to be the focus areas to ARB and ARB in December selected uh, Stockton. So unfortunately, we did we did not get uh, two Kern County cities in a row. And and you have to realize that the Air District goes all the way from Stockton. To, uh, to uh, Bakersfield and, and further south. Uh, interesting article from the Wall Street Journal talking about uh, the Trump administration's uh, very recent announcement that they are uh, going to take on um, NEPA reforms, something that uh, both Republican and Democrats in the past have uh, treated as a third rail. If, if he's actually able to get it through, it would streamline all of our uh, all of our highway projects, even little small projects. Um, progress report, f uh, January 2020 edition for all of our regionally significant projects. Flyer for the regional awards ceremony, again, March 5th, Seven Oaks. 
the uh, CMAC contingency list um, that was voted on in um, on the consent calendar. Uh, and by the way, the, the CMAC and uh, RSTP process was uh, the smoothest we have ever heard, uh, had. Every single uh, agency received um, projects that they wanted in either the full CMAC funding, contingency funding, or RSTP funding. So congratulations to all, all parties involved with that process. Flyer on the 2020 census. And finally, a schedule of cast disbursements from November and December. Subject to any questions you have, that concludes my report. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, I have a city council meeting on March 11th, so I will not be going to Sacramento. Thank you.